Well, good morning. I trust everyone is doing well. I think it's a sign that the sun might be shining. Praise the Lord. As uh, many of you who are tracking the national weather patterns, our most recent home, Texas, is clouded in snow. And uh, we had, uh, had friends email us this week and say, could you close the door from New York to Texas because you're letting... You're letting the snow. Let me just, uh, before we dive into God's Word, it is a, a true delight to be here with you all this morning on this, the Lord's Day, to celebrate the Lord's goodness toward us and, of course, Christ. And it is a privilege to be here this morning. My name is Craig. I have the honor of uh, serving here this morning as a candidate for the lead pastor position and um, just delighted to be with you this morning. I love the worship of God's people and how just simply rousing that is to the soul to be able to sing the love of God in Christ. So just before I left Texas, no, uh, if you're not clear on the backstory here, Texas is my most recent home, but not my, uh, not my origin. Of course, I, I hail from Australia. And just before I left Texas, a good friend of mine who's pastoring in, uh, in East Texas, but yet comes from uh, kind of western New York. He told me the name of the town. I didn't recognize it. He said, when you get to Rochester, you have to try a garbage plate. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I mean, I smelled, I smelled a rat right away, right? <laughs> like I was born at night, not last night. He wants me to walk into a fancy restaurant, sit down and address the waiter and say, kind sir, bring me one of your garbage plates. I thought, clearly he thinks I'm a, I'm a fool, but on arriving, I discovered, no, that's, that's a real thing. You guys have garbage plates. So just this week, I, I trialed one, and uh, it is to my disgrace to confess, I didn't finish it. And um, I don't know if that means I have to turn in my man card. I don't know if that means, I don't know if that means my candidacy is at this point void. You know, you've got to finish the garbage plate. That's 101, uh, seeking out, relocating to... Rochester, before we dive into God's Word, and we're excited to do that this morning, it is of course my privilege to thank all and many that have made these past two weeks for my wife Katerina on the front row and me, just a, a wonderful time with you all, the generosity, the hospitality, the warm, loving welcome that we've received. Really, I couldn't even put it into words if I tried and so I want to just offer my thanks, the search committee, the elders and their wives, and just so many of you who have lavished upon us your love, your welcome, even gifts and different things. We're grateful for that. So thank you. We're going to turn to God's Word, which is the reason we've gathered this morning to hear God speak to us through His inerrant, inspired Scripture. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to start our reading at verse 19 and read through to verse 23, Colossians chapter 1. Starting at verse 19, as is my practice, I mentioned this last Sunday, I like to read the Word of God and then go to God in prayer to, uh, to commit the exposition to Him. So that'll be our pattern again as we launch out into this this morning. These are the words of the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul to the church at Colossae and in turn to us, for in Him, Christ that is, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let's go to the Lord briefly in prayer. Father, we thank you for this rich, and glorious privilege this morning to gather with your people, covered and atoned for in the blood of your dear Son. We thank you, Father, that you assemble us in Christ's name on this, the Lord's day, that we would celebrate the triumph of his death, burial, and glorious resurrection. And pray, Lord God, that the gospel would just shine forth 
through these verses that we've gathered to, to understand, to celebrate, to apply to our lives today, that your spirit would be at work here in our midst and that Christ would ever be enthroned and lifted up. We ask this, Father, in his name. Amen. The summary here of these opening verses is that God, through Christ, is performing a work of reconciliation. There's, there's been a dislocation between the created order and the creator himself. There's been a, an estrangement, a separation, a brokenness. You just have to look around to see the brokenness evidenced all around us, whether it's in media or social media or just walking around and understanding the plight of humanity today. We certainly live in times where brokenness is manifested acutely. One particular commentator and exegete, Dick Lucas, who of course was, a, was an Anglican, but we can forgive him for that this morning. Uh, we love our Anglican brothers and sisters. He wrote this, this, this piercing commentary on this opening verse 19. He says, by itself, verse 19 is striking enough as a description of a unique and unrepeatable act of divine condescension. But it is only by seeing this verse in its full context that the full implications of what Paul is saying become clear. It is the fullness of the almighty God who is maker of heaven and earth that was pleased to dwell in Christ. What this paragraph demonstrates is that such a belief in Jesus as God incarnate was an essential part of the earliest Christian message. These are the words of the apostle. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Verse 20, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Last week when we looked at the, the preceding verses, we understood that the preeminence of Christ was being demonstrated and proved and proclaimed. He's before all things. He, in all things, he's preeminent. And yet this Jesus is not the kind of king to long tolerate rebellion. He is a mighty king, and he conquers and makes peace. This is an image as we read last week and we studied and understood the image of the invisible God, not a copy, not a copy. I remember some years ago I was watching a, a debate from, from an evangelical Christian who knew his Bible and, and proclaimed the truth as Scripture reveals it, and a Jehovah's Witness apologist. And the Jehovah's Witnesses tend to be, generally speaking, Arian, which you may or may not be familiar with that appellation. It means they, they deny the full divinity of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And the Jehovah's Witness apologist was pressing this claim, this point, that he's a copy, he's a copy, he's a copy. And like all copies, he's not going to be completely the same as the original. I made the quip last week, didn't I, about Kodak. Maybe an appropriate one now would be Xerox, perhaps. This is, of course, the founder of that uh, great company. We take the original, we put it in the copier, we run off a copy, we take the copy, we put it in the, the copier, we run off a copy, and we do this a hundred times, we end up with a, a, a final product that looks very little like the original article. It's the claim of heretics. In fact, that was the claim that was pervading the Colossian church in the first century. We looked at this a little last week. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the Gnostic heresy, or proto-Gnostic as it should be understood, was that Jesus was a distant emanation of the Almighty God. And that there had been copy after copy after copy after copy, but by the time Jesus could arrive, he was a, a distant relative, but not exactly like the original article. As I said, I was listening to this debate some years ago, and this Jehovah's Witness apologist was just hammering this point time and again. And yet we can see that the Holy Spirit gives us provision for dealing with this kind of foolishness. Because in Him, in Jesus Christ, not a copy, but the exact representation, the image of the invisible God, He is where the fullness of the Godhead is pleased to dwell. Not a partial, not a fraction, not a diminu diminishment of any kind. He, he bears the fullness. This phrase alone, pleased to dwell, 
I had some wonderful times this week with God through the Spirit in the Word, just on this phrase, pleased to dwell. Pleased to dwell. It's a pleasant dwelling for the fullness of the divine being. Not stifling, not compressed, not jammed in like an overpacked suitcase. The fullness of the divine being has a pleasant dwelling in the person of Jesus Christ. The image of the invisible God. The essence of the Son is so voluminous, it contains the infinity of God's fullness. To the one who is filled with infinity, he must necessarily be truly God and infinite in every sense. And what Paul wants us to do again, as we saw last week, is is trace the trajectory from theology, doctrine that is true and spirit-granted and and word-bolstered, doctrine into practice and application. The world has suffered dislocation, and Christ has come to bring reconciliation, making peace, we read, through His blood on the cross. Let's think about the diagnosis. Maybe you were here last Sunday, maybe you were not here But we spoke briefly about our inability to properly know ourselves. Our inability to properly understand our true state. You know, in in theological nomenclature, sometimes this is called the, the noetic effect of the fall. The noetic effect of the fall. We see this immediately as we're reading in Genesis, the, the fall of our original parents, Adam and Eve, when they succumb to the temptation of the serpent, they eat of the forbidden fruit and they fall. And they're so unaware of the magnitude of that sin, their initial reaction is, oh my goodness, I need some clothes, let me grab some leaves and make shift some garment immediately. This is how how clear it is that sin infiltrates every fiber of our being. We are so lost, so distant from God, so broken and helpless in our sin. We are so affected by the fall, we don't even know how affected we are by the fall. This, is, this is again shows how foolish this is. God, the infinite, omniscient being, comes to the garden to partake of his daily walk with Adam, and they hide. I don't know about you, but you see, I... I perceive that that must have been an entirely failed attempt to hide from a being who sees literally everything. This goes to show the same situation that we're all faced with, being born into this broken, fallen world, born into sin. Not even we fully understand the depth of our depravity. We need the objective ever truthful, unfailing word of God to diagnose our precise malady and circumstance. We go to the word and the word just lays our case out clearly. We think about this as far as the advent of modern medical imaging technology. How drastically has modern imaging technology improved diagnosis? Literally millions of lives have been saved Because there's very little in the human body now that can't be seen without the help of a scalpel. And yet, spiritually speaking, how many billions of souls might be saved if they take their scriptural diagnosis seriously? Let's take a look at the following verses. Verse 21. The Holy Spirit, in omniscience, now speaks about all of our circumstance, our story, is detailed here. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. These are strong words. These are staggeringly strong words. Few people have this perspective. And yet here's the reality. When we think about the, 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 the advent of, of modern medical imaging, the radiologist, so to speak, doesn't have the, the privilege of mincing his words and, and, and sugarcoating the diagnosis. He has to tell it as it is. This is what Scripture says. Sin. Sin is that which dislocates, disrupts, and brings about the estrangement from God. Sin is to ungod God. It is to dethrone deity. I take that from the Puritan Ralph Venning, who wrote the wonderful work, 
the plague of plagues. Every single one of our thoughts, attitudes, intentions, actions, and words were once a weapon of hostility leveled at the Almighty. Just for a moment, let's let that truth settle in. Those of us that are in Christ and obtained the salvation by grace through faith, freely available in Christ, this is part of all of our story. And those of us today that are yet to be in Christ, those that have have visited today and you don't yet know salvation in Jesus as we're all welcome to enjoy, this is your current story. Every single thought, attitude, intention, action, and word that is in rebellion to God The scripture says, you have taken aim at the Almighty and declared war against God. And that is not going to end well. Maybe you've heard, in recent times it's become a a pandemic of the disgusting practice of some mentally ill who attempt suicide by police shooting. See it in the news. Every now and then a report comes across of a, of a crazed maniac that wants to end his life. And so he, he rushes at the police and brandishes a lethal weapon and has himself gunned down. It's, it's a horrid, horrid reality of our broken world. And yet in much the same way, every sin is an attempt of suicide at the hand of God. You, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Verse 22 says, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. But Jesus took upon himself that hostility and bore it in his body on that cross and by his blood took away the penalty that we deserve. While our mind is hostile to Christ and God, Christ's flesh was entirely obedient even to the point of death. He is now reconciled, is the language of Colossians 1. He has now completed reconciliation. At the cross, it's a final reality. That victory is now being permeated through all reality. The current reign and the session of Christ is not static Verse 22, in order to present you holy and blameless above reproach. This is a transference. Earlier in Colossians 1, Paul deals with this. He says, we've been transferred from darkness into the kingdom of light. We were hostile. There's no merit. There's no virtue in in trying to cover over our former sins and our, our waywardness and our rebellion. There's no help for that. But an honest diagnosis from Scripture itself declares you and I were enemies of God, children of wrath. But God in Christ has made a way that we could be presented holy, blameless, above reproach. I want to share a story with you this morning that I think encapsulates this point brilliantly. The story goes back to the the mid to late 1800s, somewhere in 1867. It's a true story about an Englishman who was quite a, something of a prospector. And this Englishman thought that if he just, if he just tra- get crossed over and, and made a transatlantic ship ride, he could find his luck in the Americas. And so over he came in 1867. He loved the country so much, he was naturalized and became an American citizen. After a few years, he felt restless and dissatisfied, and he went on to Cuba And after he'd been in Cuba a little while, civil war broke out in Cuba. It was in 1867. And this man, being, you know, an Englishman, uh, turned American into a Cuban resident, was viewed with great suspicion by the Spanish government. He was arrested. His whole trial was conducted in the Spanish language. He was trialed for treason found guilty and ordered to be shot to death. The poor man did not even know what was going on. He didn't even realize that he'd been charged and found guilty and the death sentence had been leveled on him. The whole proceedings was foreign to him. And when they told him the verdict in a language he could understand, that he was guilty, condemned to be shot, he immediately sent help to the American consulate and the English consulate. Laid the whole case before these embassies. 
proving his innocence and claiming their protection, which as a dual citizen of the British Empire and the American Independent Republic, he, he felt he had the right to protection. They examined the case. They found that indeed he was right. This man was guilty. And the Spanish officers had condemned a guilty, uh, sorry, an innocent man. The two consulates, the British and the American, went to the Spanish general and said, look, this man who you have condemned is innocent. He's not guilty. But the Spanish general said this, he has been tried by our law. He has been found guilty. He must die. There was an electric cable and these men could not consult with their, their, sorry, there was no cabling. These men could not consult with their governments. The morning came in which this man was to be executed. He was brought out, sitting on his own coffin in a cart. He was drawn to the place where he was to be executed. A grave was dug. They took the coffin out of the cart. They placed the young man upon it. They took a black cap and pulled it down over his face. The Spanish soldiers awaited their orders to fire upon the man declared guilty. Moment after moment elapsed and this Englishman slash American was panicking with a sense of his immediate demise, his immediate death. And just at that moment, the English and the American consuls rode up. The English ambassador sprang out of his carriage and he took the Union Jack, the British flag. And he wrapped it around the man condemned to die. And at just that moment, the American ambassador jumped out of his carriage with the Star Spangled Banner. And he wrapped it around the man condemned to die. And both of these ambassadors then cried out to the Spanish officers, fire upon these flags if you dare. They did not dare to fire upon these two flags and provoke an international incident. These were the two great governments of the world. Behind these two emblems or flags was represented the two most powerful military forces in the world. And that was the secret of this man's deliverance. That day, this man was spared. Time was purchased in order to discover his innocence and his life was granted back to him. In Song of Solomon 2, 4-6 says this, He brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. His left hand is under my head and his right hand doth embrace me. This is the truth of the gospel. As we, as we wrestle with this challenge before us this morning, the diagnosis of Scripture is clear. Each and every one of us, unlike this particular English slash American, unlike him, we are guilty of the crimes that we've been accused of by God's holy, just law. We have sinned. We've broken God's commandments. We've broken them multiple times. We, we find ourselves without an excuse and without defense. And yet heaven's champion yet comes. And he comes into this world, incarnate in our form, in our flesh, the very eternal Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary in this world, so that he might make reconciliation by living 33 or thereabouts years, accruing a perfect righteousness. And then as he hangs on the cross, he takes upon himself our sin, our crimes, our debt to the law. God imputes to him our sinfulness. And he dies upon that cross, bearing the wrath, the shame, the penalty that our sins merited us. And the scripture says that this Jesus, through his redemptive work of living, dying, and rising, this Jesus seeks to have you and I clothed in his righteousness so that he might present us blameless before the judgment of a holy God. To put this in short form, we might use or paraphrase Paul's words to the Corinthians. That God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. When we stand before the justice of God's bar of judgment, God doesn't see you in your sin. Yes, you're a sinner. The gospel truth isn't to deny that, 
or to passively sweep over that truth. We are enemies of God in our natural state. We are at hostility. But Jesus has come to make reconciliation through his blood on the cross. To, to, as it were, to, to live a life of perfection and obedience and holiness. And then as he came to his cross, if you will, to take off that, that garment of righteousness. And to take from us the garment stained in our sin, contaminated by our flesh and our judgment. To wrap himself in our judgment and to die the death that we deserve. To take his righteousness to all who believe, to all who receive him, who believe on his name. To clothe us in his perfect obedience. That you might be presented spotless, blameless in the final day. Verse 23 finishes with these words. If you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister not shifting from this hope. What is Paul getting at? You know, some have speculated when they read this verse that leading up to this was this grand declaration of justification by faith alone, what the reformers would term sola fide, faith alone. That here in verse 23, the apostle is trying to, he's trying to kind of backdoor into that gospel the works. You've got to be good enough. You've got to be strong enough. You've got to sustain your faith. You've, you've got to maintain your good works and holiness and uprightness. I don't know about you, but for me, knowing myself, that's just not good news. Let me put it simply. If the gospel comes to someone like me and says, you can be clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness, but once you are, you have to work really hard to sustain that level of perfection. I'm waving the white flag. I'm out. I can't do that. I cannot. So verse 23, of course, is not suggesting such. But here's what Paul is suggesting. That we must find the perfect righteousness of Christ truly and entirely satisfying for us. If the gospel comes to us and we feel like what it offers us is a launching pad into us accruing our own perfection and righteousness, then this gospel has not come to us. Because Paul is telling us to continue in the faith. The faith is the confidence that Christ is enough. That Christ's righteousness is enough. That Christ's death is enough. It needs no supplication it needs no supplementation. It needs nothing added by you to save you, but simply by faith that you would receive it and not shift from this hope of the gospel that Christ is enough. As we meditate upon this, no matter how much you think about your past life, your, your sin, your misery, and the mess that maybe, maybe you've made, maybe I've made of my life, I realize that no matter how bleak or dark or immense my sin is, the perfection of Christ is always greater. It's always more glorious. Jesus is more powerful to save than I am to ruin myself. And his salvation comes as we read in this text this morning as he makes reconciliation through the blood of his cross. To look at Christ on the cross and say, it is enough. To meditate on these final words of Jesus as he hung and cried out, to tell us die, it's finished. And we bear that truth in our life. Everything that needed to be done to ransom and redeem and reconcile us has been done in Christ. What are we called to do? To stretch out the empty hand of faith and receive it, to take of it, and to not shift from this, to, as Paul says, to remain stable and steadfast, to not doubt it, to not begin to think that Jesus may not be enough. Maybe, maybe I need to add to Jesus' finished work, my good works, my perfect obedience. But Paul tells us we must continue in the faith, not shifting but to lay hold of this gospel promise proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became 
a minister. We're going to bow our heads and close our eyes. If you would join with me as we finish our time in God's Word this morning with a word of prayer, meditating on this truth this morning, that we are not good enough and that that's the best news that we could hear because Jesus is. He has done it all. He has saved each and every one who comes to him by faith and receives his promise of salvation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity this morning to meditate, Father, on your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. Father, that kind of a phrase just boggles our mind. And we love to rejoice in it and to worship the truth, Lord God, that you are all in all. We thank you for Jesus coming into our world, taking on our form, and bearing in his body the reproach of our sin. We thank you for Jesus who hung on that cross and shed his pure, innocent blood that we might be saved. We thank you that Jesus, all satisfying, all sufficient sacrifice. We thank you for Jesus who reconciles us, Father, back to you. We were hostile. We were enemies. It's a hard truth for us to swallow and comprehend, but we must do justice to the words of Scripture. We laid our weapons, aiming them at you, and yet you saved us. You redeemed and ransomed us. You call us to this grace, freely ours, in Christ. Father, this morning, use this word to edify those that believe, to strengthen their resolve and their confidence in Christ. And Father, if there are any here this morning that are yet to receive this true and rich promise, may they right now receive Jesus in their hearts by faith, not waiting to do anything or waiting for a certain time or a feeling or an emotion, but by faith to say, that gift must be mine. I want it, I receive it in Jesus' name. Father, bless this word. May it always extol and exalt Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen.